Thank you so much for having me. It's so um, wonderful to be here, and I'm a huge fan of the Sustainable Earth Institute. So I, um, a new fan actually, but a huge fan um, nonetheless. And so I'm really delighted to, to spend some time with you this afternoon. I, um, uh, by way of introduction, I'm actually a science graduate. I was born and bred in Sydney in Australia, um, and I majored in biochemistry, nutrition, and dietetics. Um, but actually, I've spent most of my career in the private sector and um, bringing public health approaches, behaviour change models um, and evidence-based practice, basically, into organisations, um, typically in roles that have become to be known um, as social entrepreneurs, so kind of internal activists getting stuff done in a different way within an organisation, because I really believe that organisations are just powerhouses of resource, actually, and if they can be directed in such a way that um, could help as part of some of the big global social challenges that we're all um, uh, confronting at the moment, then surely that would be a phenomenal um, breakthrough in, in progressing, in, uh, in, in achieving some, uh, some progress there. Um, and so, uh, as Victoria mentioned, I, I spent um, some time at Unilever, um, about 10 years. Five years of that was working on the Dove program. Um, and I now am a partner at uh, a firm called Brunswick. Um, and I work in their business and society practice. And our whole practice philosophy is that in order to be a leading business today, you need to be able to demonstrate that you, sure, create financial value, because after all, that is the mandate and the role of businesses in, in the world. But you also, crucially, must be able to demonstrate social value alongside that. And when I talk about social value, I'm including that in its broadest context, so environmental alongside um, community-based activities and, and societal uh, activities. And so if you can do that, if you can create finance and so, uh, social value, then you are in a much better position to, um, to uh, be demonstrating leadership. And we're seeing increasingly businesses do this more and more. And you only have to look at the incredible um, uh, array of uh, business leaders expressing their perspectives uh, in the wake of Trump's decision to um, withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So, you know, this is, this is quite new, actually, seeing business leaders um, take part uh, like this. They've sort of played in the past um, or in a more sort of niche way, but we're really seeing them step up. And I feel like we might be at a bit of a, a tipping point. I hope we are anyway. Um, so, delighted to be here. My brief today was to um, try and unpack how we might get some of these um, big global challenges onto the public radar screen. Um, not an easy brief and not hard to know who's in the audience and what level to pitch it at and everything. So, um, you know, help me out if I'm, um, if I'm not pitching it right. Um, and hopefully we'll finish in time to, to get a few questions. Um, so one of the first things that I always think about when I'm um, thinking about communications is um, who's my audience? And, and so in thinking about this question, this question about the wider public, um, actually, what is on their radar screen at the moment and how are they really thinking about it? Well, basically, there's a huge number of things we're asking the general public to care about. Um, and there's a lot of noise and a lot of, um, of um, sort of stamping of feet and a lot of sort of fighting for attention. Um, but when you take a step back and you try and make sense of all of that noise, you can really distill these, um, all of the noise into uh, sort of three mega trends and 11 major challenge or what we call conversation themes. And so the, the three mega trends are um, um, technology, globalization, and sustainability. And then you, you may not be able to read them all, and it doesn't actually matter for the, for the purpose of the talk, but, but there are about 11 major um, challenges. And then within those 11 major challenges, there, um, there are topics of conversation. And those topics of conversation actually change um, given the sort of mood of, of the, the moment. Um, but the themes actually endure. And so, for example, in health, and it's a 
great place to start for this afternoon. But in health, it used to be, um, you know, HIV AIDS was the, the big topic that everyone was really focused on. About a handful of years ago, it was um, non-communicable diseases. Today, the heat is in antimicrobial resistance. And so, you, of course, the rest of those conversations continue and there still remain interest groups in all of the areas and lots of people are still trying to fight for space to continue those conversations. Um, but they do change in terms of um, the, the heat in, in, in the moment. And so the point of this is that there's just a hell of a lot of conversations out there, a hell of a lot of global challenges that we're asking people um, to care about. And that is one of the things that makes it so, so tricky to actually get anything or one particular thing onto the public radar screen. But there are a couple of other uh, things that are also making this quite difficult at the moment. First of all, it's the, the environment, the landscape in which we find ourselves in. So it's massively crowded, like we said, but it's also changing. Communications today is like communications at no other point in time in history. Um, not only are we constantly bombarded with messages, but they're also um, uh, typically in, in sort of bubbles. Um, the way in which we're hearing messages are uh, often today online, and the way in which those online conversations are organised is by algorithms, and so we end up really um, uh, either reinforcing our existing point of view or um, our friends' points of view are being reinforced for us. And so the spectrum of perspective that we're getting is increasingly narrow. And that's not just in social media, it's also in search. So in our online exploration of challenges and so on, that is also coming up. The other thing to think about is that the way we're processing information is, is becoming harder and has become harder. Basically, we're sort of triaging all the time. What is it that we have to take on and hold in our minds and what can we just dump? And so we're really just taking on the headlines most of the time, picking them up and dropping them, picking them up and dropping them. And actually, how do we get people to engage in bigger, deeper conversations around some of these global challenges if all they're seeing are the headlines? That's, that's a tricky thing. And of course, the trust landscape is changing as well. Um, we, we've all experienced over the last couple of years um, Brexit and Trump and, and a number of, um, of uh, uh, elections over, uh, across Europe uh, over the last couple of years. And, um, and this idea of sort of the, the trust in experts really declining. And so how are people really filtering the information they get and deciding what it is that they're going to listen to? It's probably no surprise to you guys that, that actually it's the people that are closest to them that they seem to be, um, to, to be trusting more. Um, another reason that makes it really tough to um, get some of these global challenges on the public radar is their complexity. They're hard to understand and they're hard to solve. So they're hard to understand often because people are using a hell of a lot of jargon. The people who actually are the experts who know what they're actually talking about um, find it really tough, it seems, to distill those challenges into really easy to understand and digest kind of concepts that people can hold. Um, we also, because we're getting so much um, information at once and probably for several other reasons, we have very limited um, attention spans. We don't have the patience to explore something that we're not really that interested in. In the context of my daily life, when I'm taking the kids to school or I'm trying to, you know, remember the milk or I'm trying to, you know, be at my desk and on a conference call and at a conference and trying to listen to everything all at once. There's so much going on. Why would I be interested in something that isn't of immediate um, concern to me right now? And they're really hard to solve. And when you think about, um, you think about, uh, this at a at a um, at a level of maybe influencers or decision makers as well. A, there's nothing that is typically there's no quick fix for any of these big global challenges. They're largely intractable, and um, and often there's competing dilemmas here. So um, one example is, is a client of mine, it's a bank in Australia. They are trying to divest themselves from um, from coal. So they're trying to become more green. Um, but they also are incredibly conscious of the fact that if they remove their funding of coal mining, 
they're also removing the livelihoods of entire communities in regional areas in Australia. So how do you choose, right? It's always this balancing act in that space. Not all, um, nearly all of these big global challenges have these competing ethical dilemmas at play. And so how we sort of unpack that um, as a community of people to try and figure that out is going to be really, really important. They also... Um, Global challenges tend to be politicised and then become political. And what do I mean by that? The people that get great cut through when it comes to global challenges simplify um, what they say uh, and they do it in such a way that makes it almost binary. So you become on one side of an argument or another. And then that gets reinforced because of the nature of the silos that we're, um, that we're operating in from a communications perspective. And so um, because they become, you know, you sort of become tribal about it somehow. I think it should be either this way or that way. And then, and then that gets reinforced and then that becomes what goes on to the policy agenda in many cases. And so that makes it really tricky as well because when you're talking about complex global challenges, it very rarely is black and white. And, and lastly, of course, that makes it emotional, as many, uh, as many of you will, will sort of feel as, uh, about a lot of these global challenges. When you really care about um, something, whether the outcome is positive or negative, you're, you're a winner or a loser, it's like really quite, people get really fired up about it. Um, and that's some of the reasons why it's so tricky to get these sort of technical, complicated um, um, challenges on, on people's... Um, on people's radars. Um, so how do we actually um, make some progress? Um, as Victoria was saying, marketing and communication campaigns can help, I think. Um, and marketing is all about behaviour change. And there are loads of different models for, um, for um, demonstrating how you might think about behaviour change through marketing campaigns. This is one of my favourites. Four simple steps, um, awareness, engagement, conversion and advocacy. How, like, do I know about it? Have I heard of this problem? Um, then, what, do I care about it? Am I engaged in it? Am I sort of emotionally invested? Can I think about it? Do I give up some of my already crowded headspace for it? Can I then take some kind of action, no matter how, um, how big or small, can I act on this um, caring about this issue in some way? And then can I advocate for it? Can I actually share what I've done? Can I encourage other people to either become aware or care or take some kind of action as well? And so it becomes a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a cycle. And um, the thing that gets you started on any kind of marketing campaign is, if you're a disciplined marketeer, is a brief. You have to really kind of dissect the problem that you're trying to understand. And by problem, we need to understand the actual problem in the outside world and the communications problem that we have as well. So this is kind of a very, anyone who's a marketeer in the room will go, what are you talking about? Because it's very high level, <laughs> um, brief. Usually they're very, very detailed. But um, the first thing that people try and um, distill is what's the strategic objective? What problem is it that we're trying to solve? Secondly, what are the sort of dimensions of it? How big is it? How far do we want to reach with this kind of challenge? Then what are the mindsets or behaviours involved in creating that problem that we are trying to change through our marketing and communications? Who are the key players? What is our audience? Can we actually map them on the spectrum of awareness, engagement, conversion and advocacy? Because sure, sure enough, more people will be aware then there are people who will care, then there will be people who will actually take an action, and there will be people who will then pass on and become advocates, right? So, um, so can we kind of segment these people into these different buckets? But also, like, are they uh, really strong influences of other people? Like, I, I, either positively or negatively? Are they preventing people taking action? This sort of big mapping that people do often with, um, with their communications audiences. Insights is really critical. What do we know about each of these audiences? 
Um, and that's part of the mindsets and behaviours, um, but it's specific to those audiences. And I'll come back to that briefly in a second. And crucially, what is the role for communications in driving that change? And I would argue that many times, and I see this in um, a lot of the work that I do with universities and with non-government organisations, a lot of the time, um, the, the default thinking is, let's get consumers on board, let's get the, the, the sort of general public interested in this, and that will create a demand because why wouldn't anyone want to be on board? And then, I feel like my earrings are like jiggling here. Are they? I'm really sorry. What I was, I was saying is that most people, um, are, oh, it's a really common thing to think that let's create great, like this sort of swirl of public activity, and then, um, and then the problem will at least be opened up to other audiences, and then maybe we might drive some progress. And whilst that's true in many instances, it's not always true. And in fact, if you look at things like, uh, or global challenges, like the transition to renewable energy, you know, we could all be doing every single thing in our power as individuals to support that. But actually, there are two main drivers of that transition, technological breakthroughs and, um, and fi green financing, like energy financing, the econ economics that sit behind it. And so actually, you'd be far more impactful, far more efficiently, if you targeted the top 100 players in that space got them on board to change than you would be in trying to like get all the people on, in the grassroots moving. So that's one thing. The other example I would use there would be conflict minerals. And so whilst people, whilst a portion of society and not everyone can be uh, encouraged to care about the six-year-old in the Congo digging for tungsten, mining for tungsten, um, actually a campaign that drives that sort of awareness around that problem is not going to be as effective as getting together the likes of Intel and a handful of other companies alongside regulators and um, leading NGOs that are operating in that space and then them taking a lead on that. And so just Bear in mind, I guess, is my message there, that the role for communications can sometimes be in lobbying for change at the individual level or in the sort of small community level as it is in, um, in, the, in the general public. And then how will we know we're successful? I mean, that's kind of best practice, right? Like, what's the evaluation part? I said I'd come back to insights. Um, this is a very, very high level um, tool, but it's something that I find incredibly useful every time I'm going into some kind of communications moment. Um, and this is something I use both with individuals as well as with um, mass media campaigns and population driving, um, population changing campaigns. Um, listen to me, population changing, like I hope it's population changing, but the intention being how do we set them up? Um, the insight, and a hell of a lot of research goes into the left-hand side here, the insights are really trying to understand what is it that the key audience that, we've t that we're targeting currently do in relation to this problem. And what are they also currently thinking, feeling and believing about it? That's where we are today. Then where do we want them to be? What is it that we actually specifically want them to do? How can we break it down so it's a singular action? What do we want them to be thinking, feeling and believing after the campaign or tomorrow as such? So, um, and once you've sort of crystallised what that is, you can then think about um, the types of communications that you can um, put together, types of content, the language, the messaging that you use, as well as the visual imagery and the nature of the, cha the communications channels that you might be using, the conversation that you're trying to start. Um, and there are three kind of um, key principles when trying to move people sort of um, from awareness right through um, uh, the continuum to, um, to advocacy. And the first is, um, being single-minded. How can we be really strict with ourselves to focus on one thing? What is the one thing we want them to know? What is the one thing we want them to care about? What is the one thing we want them to do? And what is the one thing we want them to tell their mates about? Like, that is so hard in complex challenges, right? Really, really tough. 
but it's so effective when you get it right. And what it means is we, as people that want to drive change, need to actually be quite patient or we need to have lots of these going in a coordinated way. But in a single communications moment, you've got one thing to say. Um, the second is authenticity. How credible can your voice be? And a huge thing about credibility is being consistent. Consistent in your tone, consistent in your stance that you take on things. And if you're changing your mind on something, being able to justify and explain it. Just consistency is, is absolutely key there. And making it easy. Like the, the best way to get someone to take an action is to remove the barriers from taking an action. You know, it's like, how do you um, um, get people to... This is a very um, complicated example, but I used to use it when I was doing um, um, physical activity training and stuff like that in my, in my early career. Um, how do you get people to exercise, right? Obviously, there's lots and lots of complex um, elements of this. But do you motivate the hell out of them with your high ponytail and your big sort of jazzy stuff? Or do you just take away why they're not exercising? You know, do you give them a bit of extra time or do you give them a bit of confidence? You know, like, it's not... It, I totally appreciate how simplistic I just made that, but, um, but you get the point, right? You're kind of reducing um, the barriers. And I know I've only got a couple of minutes, but I'm going to canter through some of the sort of just tips that I um, might offer from things that I've picked up over, over, over the years um, of how to convince people to move to the next stage in the continuum. And it all comes down to what you say and how you say it. And so a few things on the what you say. Put your audience first. So um, people just um, want to hear what is relevant to them. The evidence that you might use um, to, to convince one of your friends um, will be entirely different to what would convince someone who isn't in the same circle as you, right? So think about what would convince them. And a tool that I often use is asking, so what? So we've got this problem, so what? So what? And so what? And so what? You feel like a four-year-old. Um, but it's a very, very effective way of distilling it down and getting to the actual crux. Be really clear. Keep it simple. We've kind of said that a few times already. But the most, um, the, the most powerful messages are the ones that are the simplest. Be memorable, quotable and tweetable. If they take away one thing from your conversation, what's it going to be? Is it the rule of three that you use, that there's just three things that you have to think of? Or is it like, what's the 140 character thing that you want them to go off and, um, and, and say to their, to their groups? The 12-year-old test. How would you explain this to a smart 12-year-old? It's really, um, if you know 12-year-olds, they're pretty smart, so you can use some good language, but this kind of, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a really good discipline to think about, um, again, distilling that um, concept. And then, um, this is Aristotle. Many of you will um, know probably what I'm about to say. Um, but the one real trick is appealing to, these, to anyone as a human. You know, like regardless of what their title is or regardless of um, where they are, what is going to convince them? And Aristotle wrote about the power of persuasion and the balance between pathos, ethos and logos. And logos being the rational arguments, ethos being the trust and credibility, the reputation drivers, and pathos being the emotion, the way in which they feel about it, right? And, um, and I can't remember what the percentages are, but it's a hell of a lot in the ethos, um, in the pathos space, right? Followed by ethos and a tiny bit of logos. So ditch the data. If you're going to use data, use one piece, you know, um, and and really, really go for the pathos. Now, with a science background, I totally know how hard it is to sort of speak um, uh, in emotional tones in something that you actually really care deeply about and are convinced of the scientific evidence for the logos of. And so I thought I might finish by just sharing a little bit about um, how you might communicate with pathos and a lot of that just comes down to storytelling but there is a science to storytelling actually it sort of brings together art and science and when you study stories when you really sort of get under the skin of them there's a clear taxonomy and um, this is a picture of what they call the hero's journey but every almost yeah basically every single story 
follows this pattern. There's a state of status quo in the ordinary world. And then there's a call to adventure. And then there's a bunch of challenges on the road. But then help arrives and they discover whatever it is they're discovering. And then they return to the ordinary world um, to create a new normal. And this, um, I can tell some of you aren't really convinced. But if you look at Disney, right, or fairy tales, it's the same shape time and time and time again. Once upon a time, here's our hero. Every day she does this and that until one day something happens. But then after lots of stuff happens, at last this happens and then we all live happily ever after. The end. And so this is kind of a really clear, um, uh, engaging storytelling method, but you can use it for AMR, you can use it for climate change, you can use it for any, any kind of um, communication at all. And so I would just encourage you when you're um, trying to get that cut through on the public radar, whether um, if you can start constructing some of your messaging and your communications in a similar way, maybe we might get um, some of these global challenges on the public radar the way that, um, you know, with the same success as Moana or Frozen or, you know, the next Beauty and the Beast. So um, thank you very much for having me.